Sutra All Buddhas of the Three Buddhas of Time have Dharma bodies which are completely pure. According to those who should be transformed, they can universally manifest wonderful form bodies. The first common doesn't think to himself, I will make a body like this. Rather, it naturally reveals itself, and he never gives rise to distinctions. Commentary All Buddhas of the Three Bearers of Time have Dharma bodies which are completely pure. All Buddhas of the Ten Directions and the Three Bearers of Time are like measureless and valleys sand grains in the Ganges River. They are Narutas of Asamhyayas, inexpressible, incalculable numbers of them. In spite of the fact that there are so many Buddhas, the Dharma body of all Buddhas is just one Dharma body. Although we talk about all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and Three Buddhas of Time, nonetheless, they mutually share a single Dharma body. The lives of Buddhas reciprocally illumine one another. The emptiness of Buddhas is interpenetrating. The minds of Buddhas are mutually sealed, and the bodies of Buddhas are of one identical substance. There aren't any differences among them. There isn't any discrimination of self or others, just as one Buddha teaches and transforms living beings. So too are all Buddhas teaching and transforming living beings. And all Buddhas teaching and transforming living beings is just a single Buddha teaching and transforming living beings. So the Buddha's Dharma body, his response and retribution body, and his transformation bodies are all of the same substance. They are all one body. There isn't any discrimination of self or others between them. They aren't at all like people who think, you do your thing and I do my thing. They don't make such distinctions. When the Buddhas do things, one is all and all is one. Buddhas don't make distinctions among themselves. You could also say that many Buddhas are just one Buddha, and one Buddha is many Buddhas. They divide and yet are not divided. They are unified and yet are not unified. And so the Dharma body is completely pure. Although the Buddhas have different names, their basic substance is one. We people in this mundane world make all kinds of discriminations and self and others, of self and others. The Buddhas don't make discriminations among themselves, so there's no self and no others as far as they are concerned. And so, all is one, one is all. What is mean? What is mean by Buddha? The most people think about the Buddha. They are confused about the Buddha. They say the Buddha is some spiritual entity that the Buddha is imperceivable. In fact, that's not the way it is. The Buddha is just true principle, and true principle is just the Buddha. If you understand true principle, you have a clear understanding of the Buddha. If you don't clearly understand true principle, you don't have a clear understanding of the Buddha Dharma. True principle says there is wisdom you can enter. There is cultivation that can be cultivated. If you have wisdom and you can cultivate the drama, then you can deeply enter the basic substance and nature of the Buddha. If you don't have wisdom and you don't cultivate, then you won't be able to enter the substance and nature of the Buddha. And yet, you are also never apart from the substance and nature of the Buddha. You are still there within the true principle. Before, it was said that you can't see the Buddha in marks of, or form. Well, if we can't see the Buddha in forms or characteristics, what do we look for? Look for true principle. True principle doesn't have substance or marks. It doesn't have characteristics. It is the real mark which is without marks. Because it has no marks, therefore it has no distinctions. According to those who should be transformed, they can universally manifest wonderful form bodies. Although true emptiness is without marks, that does not prevent it from containing wonderful existence. And so within the unchanging basic substance, there is still according with conditions. 
if you cannot cope with conditions, then you can manifest whatever transformation is appropriate. The Tathagata appears in whatever transformation body is appropriate in order to teach and transform living beings and cross them over. This is to say, he speaks to living beings in whatever body is appropriate to cross them over and to cause them to accomplish the way. Whatever transformation is appropriate for whatever kind of living being is the transformation body he appears in. For example, if one needs to be crossed over by the body of a Buddha, then the Buddha will manifest the body of a Buddha and speak the Dharma. If one needs to be taken across by the body of a Pratyeka Buddha, then the Buddha will manifest the body of a Pratyeka Buddha to speak the Dharma and cross over this living being. If the body of a Brahma king is appropriate, he manifests the body of a Brahma king to speak the Dharma and take living beings across. If the body of a Brahma minister is needed to take one across, then they manifest the body of a Brahma minister to speak the Dharma for living beings. If the body of an elder or lay person is needed to take one across, then he manifests the body of an elder or lay person to speak the Dharma. If the body of a young lady or a maiden is needed to cross over to cross one over, then he manifests the body of a young lady or a maiden and speaks the Buddha Dharma. And so whatever living being's body is appropriate in order to take someone across, that's the body the Buddha manifests. According to their kind, the Buddha teaches and transforms living beings and speaks the Buddha Dharma for them. All kinds of wonderful form bodies universally pervade and manifest everywhere. The Buddha can universally display bodies of all living beings and then speak the Dharma for them. The first common doesn't think to himself, I will make a body like this. The Buddha isn't like living beings who strike up false thoughts every day. He doesn't think in this way. I think this and I think that. I think I want to accomplish Buddhahood. I think I want to become a living being. I think I want to be number one. I want to be finer than everybody else. I want to get rich. I think I want to be famous. These are all just big false thoughts. Nor does he think, I think I want a good family, I want a good body, a really healthy body. Thoughts like that are aimed at seeking self-benefit. There are thoughts to help yourself. The Buddha doesn't have false thoughts that he has manifested a body, perhaps the body of a Buddha or the body of a Pratika Buddha or an Ahas body. He doesn't have these kinds of thoughts. It is in the absence of false thoughts that such transformations can occur. He doesn't have to think, and yet these transformation bodies very naturally appear. They are very naturally brought about without any kind of effort in their creation. When a transformation is appropriate, it isn't thought up. Rather, it naturally reveals itself. All kinds of bodies are manifested, and he never gives rise to distinctions. He manifests all kinds of bodies, and yet doesn't make any kind of discrimination. Why is this? It is because in the past, his vow power and the various virtues attained from his cultivation of the six perfections, the ten thousand conducts and his great awesome spiritual powers were completely brought to accomplishment. And so he doesn't need to make any kind of effort in the creation of these bodies. He doesn't have to think about it. For instance, if you're asked a question you have to think about it before you answer and once you have to think about it before you answer you've already fallen behind you're way behind if you didn't have to think before answering you would be capable of informing this creation if you have to think about it even for a second then you've fallen behind by several tens of thousands of great compass to think about it means you have no wisdom People with real wisdom understand immediately without even having to do anything. It's like a really sharp knife which can slice a hair into many sections. 
the knife is so sharp that if a strand of hair were blown against it, it would sever it instantly. The blade is that sharp. That's the kind of sharpness that's meant here, being that way is called understanding the mind and seeing the nature, having no afflictions and having no worries. Sutra, he makes no discrimination about the Dharma realm and also does not rely on it. Yet, in the midst of the mundane world, he manifests measureless bodies. Commentary, he makes no discrimination about the Dharma realm. Though worlds of the ten directions are within the Dharma realm of the Buddha, the Buddha considers one world to be all worlds and all worlds to be one world. To the exhaustion of empty space and the boundaries of the Dharma realm, all those different worlds are without any kind of distinction among them, and he also does not rely on it. The Dharma realm is without a place of reliance, and the Buddha's Dharma body also has no place of reliance either. If he had a place of reliance, then there would also be places that he didn't rely on because it would be by means of the places he didn't rely on that his place of reliance would be defied. But a Buddha has no place of reliance whatsoever. Yet, in the midst of the mundane world, he manifests measureless bodies. Within the world, he displays a limitless number of bodies. Sutra, the Buddha's body is changeless, however, it does transform. For in the midst of the unchanging Dharma, he makes appear shapes by transformation. Commentary The Buddha's body is changeless. Originally, the Buddha's body cannot be sought in form. So you don't look for it in form, and yet it never leaves form. You can't leave aside physical form when you talk about the Buddha's body. The Buddha's body never changes. But you can't leave aside changes and transformations when you go looking for the Buddha. Translates refers to it being true suchness. Therefore, true suchness is the Buddha's Dharma body. The Buddha's Dharma body is unchanging. It occurs with conditions and yet it doesn't change. However, it does transform. It occurs with conditions and so you can't say it doesn't change and transform. For in the midst of the unchanging Dharma, he makes appear shapes by transformation. From within the Dharma, which does not change, according to conditions, shapes are brought about through transformation. What is this like? It's like the situation of some people walking together down the road at night to see a tree trunk from a great distance, and one of them say, there's somebody up there. An ignorant person in the crowd agrees and says, yep, there's somebody up there. But a person with wisdom who can see a little better then tells them, you say it's a person but it's not. The one who thought it was a person then jumps to another conclusion and say, oh, it's not a person, look, it's a ghost. It certainly must be a ghost. But all along is just a tree chunk. The principle here is that at first glance, you mistake shape for something is not then a second glance, you speculate further about what the shape is and eventually may distinguish the thing as being a tree trunk. The person has a natural has nature everywhere calculated and attached to and the nature that arises dependent on something else. So he gives rise to false speculations. Both conclusions he jumps to that it is a person and that it is a ghost are the nature everywhere calculated and attached to. Finally, recognizing it as a tree is a nature that arises dependent on something else. Another way to put it is that a person sees a rope and his first thought is, what is that? The second thought is, that's definitely a snake. That's the nature everywhere calculated and attached to his gas is scared when he thinks it is a snake, but upon closer examination, he realizes it's a rope. That's the nature that arises dependent on something else. If he were to take the rope 
apart and discover that it is just fibers of hemp, then it out there's really nothing there at all. It's empty. That's the perfectly accomplished real nature. So if you can understand this analogy, you can also understand the Buddha's body within non-changing, it follows conditions. Unchanging and yet changing, it doesn't move and yet follows conditions. Sutra. Proper enlightenment cannot be measured. It is equal to the Dharma realm and empty space, unfathomable in its depth and vastness. It is completely cut off from the path of words and language. The first common is skillfully able to penetrate. He practices the way in every place. He can travel without obstruction to the multitudes of countries in the Dharma realm. Commentary Proper enlightenment cannot be measured. It is equal to the Dharma realm and empty space. Proper enlightenment is just the Buddha. Ultimately, how many Buddhas are there? They are innumerable. How many living beings are there? There are as many living beings as there are Buddhas. Living beings are just the division bodies of the Buddha. Buddhas are basic substance of living beings. Divided, they measure this. United, they are one. Therefore, there isn't any division between living beings and Buddhas. Buddhas are the Buddhas of living beings, and living beings are the living beings of Buddhas. So how do living beings accomplish Buddhahood? First, they have to cast out greed, hatred, and stupidity, and diligently cultivate precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. Let's take greed as a case of inquiry. Everybody has in mind that is greedy, filled with insatiable greed. If we don't satisfy our greed, we give rise to ignorance, then we become afflicted. And when we have afflictions, we do all kinds of stupid things. This whole process reveals a lack of propriety. So greed, hatred, and stupidity are called the three poisons. Speaking of greed, perhaps one is greedy for name, perhaps one is greedy for benefit, or maybe one is greedy for blessings and profit. There are many kinds of greed and desires. Where do greed and desires come from? They come from thoughts which are selfish. If you don't have selfish thoughts, then you won't have a lot of greed and desire. If you were without greed and desire, you wouldn't have a lot of afflictions. If you didn't have a lot of afflictions, then your wisdom would manifest. You wouldn't be stupid or confused. So by purely cultivating precepts, samadhi and wisdom, we completely eradicate greed, hatred and stupidity. Precepts mean stop evil, stopping evil and guarding against transgressions. They also mean not doing any evil and offering up all kinds of good conduct. If you don't do any evil and can offer up all good conduct, then you are constantly in samadhi. Having proper concentration produces wisdom. From holding precepts, samadhi arises and from samadhi comes wisdom. When you have wisdom, you can smash through stupidity and ignorance. So why haven't we have people accomplish Buddhahood? It's just because we have greed, hatred, and stupidity. And so we haven't been able to purely cultivate precepts, samadhi, and wisdom. The Buddha's purely cultivated precepts, samadhi, and wisdom and completely eradicated greed, hatred, and stupidity. They did this over a long period of time, little by little, step by step. Buddhas basically are the same as living beings, but because they got rid of all their faults and bad habits, they accomplished Buddhahood. If we living beings could get rid of our bad faults and habits, completely casting them out, then we too could very quickly accomplish Buddhahood. Buddhas are greatly enlightened beings. They truly understand Everyone can accomplish Buddhahood. Everyone can attain great enlightenment and great wisdom. Buddha isn't an exclusive name laid aside for Buddhas only. There's hope for all of us living beings too. We can all become Buddhas. Living beings are included with the nine Dharma realms. The Dharma realm of Bodhisattvas. The Dharma realm of the conditionally enlightened ones. The Dharma realm of self hearers The Dharma realm of gods the Dharma realm of humans, the Dharma realm of Asuras, 
the Dharma realm of hell beings, the Dharma realm of hungry ghosts, and the Dharma realm of animals. These are all called living beings. When Shakyamuni Buddha realized proper enlightenment, he said, "All living beings have the Buddha nature. All can accomplish Buddhahood. All of you people who have wisdom, think about it. We are all included within the definition of living beings. We can all accomplish Buddhahood. Buddhas and living beings are level and equal. However, Buddhas have already attained their inherent great wisdom. We living beings haven't attained." Our inherent wisdom yet, and so we continue to be stupid and attached. When the Buddhas first began their cultivation of the way, they were living beings just like we are, but they endure what people cannot endure. They yield where people cannot yield. They ate what people are unable to eat. They bore what people cannot bear. That is why they were able to rise above the crowd and become outstanding individuals. Thus, the Buddhas were able to return to the origin and go back to the source. They returned to their inherent wisdom. They cultivated and sacrificed themselves for others. Shakyamuni Buddha, for instance, gave up his body for a tiger, and he cut up his flesh into pieces to feed an eagle. He practiced bitter practices that are too difficult for most people. He was a person who made a vow to cultivate, and then later he was certified to the fruit of ahasip. Then he cultivated the bodhisattva path, the six paramitas, and then ten thousand practices. He had to cross over living beings by cultivating the bodhisattva path.